One of the great qualities of dictatorship is that dictators can hold the line even as democracies start to fade. That, of course, is the theory of pretty much every dictator across history when faced with a democratic rival. That is certainly the theory of Vladimir Putin today, whether it is in Ukraine or whether it's re with regard to him just killing you know, the people who oppose him, people like Alexei Navalny. And it's becoming very clear this week that Vladimir Putin is now settling all family business. This is the week where he feels like he has the ability to do exactly what it is that he wants. And the reason he feels that way is because of a combination of splits on the right in the United States and a combination of splits on the left in the United States, as well as splits in the European coalition with regard to Russia. When Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, there was pretty much unanimity that this was not something that the West could allow to stand. You couldn't have Vladimir Putin simply waltzing into Kiev, taking over the country, killing Vladimir Zelensky, and essentially setting up a puppet dictator and turning Ukraine into a second Belarus. You couldn't have that because it would put Russia directly on the borders of a wide variety of NATO countries, including Hungary and Poland. You, you couldn't have it because it would certainly threaten former Soviet satellite states like Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, all of which are deeply fearful of a Putin-led incursion into their territory, Finland as well. You couldn't have it because Ukraine actually is a relatively major producer of products like wheat and oil. And mostly you couldn't have it because Vladimir Putin has interests that are antithetical to those of the West. And for all of the talk about over the last 25 years about how Vladimir Putin was just on the cusp of moderating, how it, there was going to be a moment when Vladimir Putin was welcomed into the family of nations and then he would just be nice to everybody. That never happened. Every single president of my lifetime has tried a reset with Vladimir Putin. George W. Bush famously looked into Putin's eyes and thought he had a sense of his soul. And then you had Barack Obama, who literally sent Hillary Clinton, his secretary of state, to Moscow to give them a button that didn't actually say reset, but was supposed to be a reset button. And then you had Vladimir Putin being offered flexibility by Barack Obama in 2012 in the lead up to the 2012 election. And then Donald Trump came into the office and the basic assumption was that Donald Trump was going to lead to a warm relationship with Putin. And now you have Joe Biden, who came into office and was immediately pretty soft on Russia in terms of sort of geopolitical strategery. Um, one of the things that, you know, that hits me about that immediately is, uh, you know, I kept thinking of the, uh, you remember the Seinfeld episode where they uh, talk about the uses of the phrase yada yada, in conversation, you know, which, which I've things not really we, watched uh, Seinfeld, so I do not know that episode. Oh, uh, fucking Brits. Uh, yeah, Gene, if you're going to live in our country, you need to, I have to learn your ways, way. which is exactly. apparently Seinfeld. Yes. Uh, yeah, so there's this big discussion of um, telling stories, and you say, oh, this happened, and then this happened, yada, yada, and like which things it's sort of okay to yada, yada away. And, um, you know, in that he just, uh, yada, yada is away, uh, the entire, uh, the entire Trump record on, uh, on, on relations of Russia, which seems like, you know, it would have considerably complicated the story he's trying to tell here. Yeah, I think, uh, it's a, I mean, yes, various American administrations have tried to reset with Putin, uh, obviously, that hasn't worked, but the reason they're resetting with Putin every time is because Russia is not one of those countries that you can just willingly isolate uh, for no reason. You know, the isolation that Russia has today, which is far from absolute, is a product of a very specific, specific uh, um, uh, set of uh, events and violations of international norms. Um, but you know, even that hasn't really pushed the needle on it uh, that much. Russia still trades with the international community. And for some reason, the Germans seem to think if they buy the Russian natural gas through Turkey or another country, that that somehow washes it. So this trade is all still taking place. But yeah, it's a kind of misleading narrative of what's going on. I mean, on one hand, yes, you know, Russia has intervened in the affairs of its neighboring countries, uh, you know, Part of it we can see as a response to uh, the Bush doctrine of preemptive strikes. You know, the war in Georgia uh, perhaps wouldn't have happened if the United States hadn't gone into Iraq without, you know, 
even a plausible reason for going in. You know, the United States could have got away with going into Afghanistan after 9-11, but, but uh, Iraq was seen as a real violation of that those international norms. So, you know, he's following that particular pattern. And the notion that, I don't know, I, th I just find it not super plausible that the Soviet, you know, that the, Putin's trying to rebuild the Soviet Union and that he's trying to, He's mm -hmm. planning to intervene in Finland and Poland and places like that, at least militarily. And if anything, this war has taught us that, you know, Russian military capabilities aren't to be sniffed at. But the fact that they're still two years into this war and, you know, there's no clear sign of victory, really, I'm kind of skeptical that a, a, a Russian military intervention into the Balkans or into Finland or into uh, Poland is particularly uh, on the cards. So, yeah, I mean the the uh, the initial attempt to take Kiev and uh, impose regime change was defeated kind of right away, like like to a certain extent before Western aid, uh, new Western aid, right beyond what had happened before, uh, could could even play that much of a role. I mean, it was um, it. You know, it, it seems like that's been, and yes, as you say, you know, Russian military capacity has nothing to be sneezed at. I mean, they're, they're certainly in a position to keep grinding away at the war, but like, uh, it, it does seem like, you know, the, like even, um, you know, what was supposed to be, you know, it's like, oh, this isn't even really a war. This is like a, you know, a few weeks long, you know, special military operation, uh, did not, you know, work out that way at all. Uh, the, probably you know my sense is that you know they if you know if russian military capacity had been what it was in like 1991 that would have been one thing but like um it's it seems like over the decades probably like everything else in russian society uh it's you know been institutionally degraded and you know and just wasn't um you know wasn't there and since spring of 2022 like taking kiev doing regime change has been really off the table and and the question is more like where's the eventual border between Russia and Ukraine going to be in in the Donbas? Uh, so it seems like, given that even Ukraine is like a years long grind that's not going to end in complete success, the idea that you know other Ben is is spinning here that um, you know that like if we don't you know if we don't hold the line. And, you know, we listen to these voices on the right and the left that he's talking about, you know, who are too isolationist that, you know, Russia is just going to be sweeping through Lithuania and Finland is just, you know, this, this really does not seem in touch with reality. I mean, just just to, just in terms of capacity, like forget desire, just just in terms of like what they have the actual ability to do. It doesn't seem within the realm of reality. Yeah, it, it, it just doesn't seem uh, like you say, it's a plausible you know, military option for the uh, for the Russians. I mean, my good friend Harun Yilmaz, who works on Russian history, a, a historian of Russia, he pointed he didn't believe that the war would take place, uh, but for the right reasons, in the sense that he was like, this isn't Georgia. The Ukrainians have been armed by uh, Obama and Trump over the years, and it's going to end up in a kind of meat grinder. And that's why the Russians aren't going to do it, because they know they've only got one bullet. And once they fire that bullet, um, you know, their military capacity and ability is going to be exposed. So, you know, this notion of Russia as an existential threat to specifically the United States seems a little bit misleading. Now, if you're a country neighboring sure. Russia... Sure, you're going to be concerned. You know, a lot of the discourse around, like, you know, pro-Russian discourse is, you know, the Russians were provoked. Well, yeah, you can say that, but equally, you can say all their neighbors are being provoked into uh, cozying up with the U United States and the Western Bloc as well, because you know that's the nature of interstate conflict. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So, if anything, you know, Russia has kind of shot itself in the foot and his and it might eke out some kind of pyrrhic victory in ukraine but it would seem madness for putin and his regime to go on any further military adventures in western europe maybe they'll mess around in central asia but that will upset chinese interests in there 
in the Caucasus, but it, then again, you know, Russian influences in the Caucasus seems to be somewhat waning uh, with, you know, countries like Azerbaijan being able to kind of humiliate Russia over their violation of the ceasefire pertaining to the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict, which ended in that ethnic cleansing of the Armenian population from there. So, you know, from the, you know, putting your American patriot uh, hat on, uh, you know, if you're looking from American, it, from the American perspective, is Russia really that fr big a threat to the United States? Is it even a threat to, uh, you know, the powers of Eastern Europe these days? Yeah, no, exactly. Like it's, um, you know, I mean, Russia, you know, there, there is definitely an element of, um, you know, imperial bullying and its relationships with some of its immediate neighbors. Uh, and I know some leftists don't like it when you say that because they think that, like, there could only be one empire at a time. And if you're not the global behemoth with hundreds of military bases everywhere, then nothing, you know, nothing you do can count, right? But I don't think you need that, right, to, to sort of... Right, you, you don't know, need the argument try, that... Went, went try to dominate, you know, some immediate neighbors. But, like, that's a very different thing from saying that it's like some great Hitlerian thread of like world conquest. I mean, that's just not real. Yeah. I mean, people love to use the world war two analogies. It seems to be, we're living still in the shadow of world war two, but really, you know, it's a very different state of affairs uh, around the globe. And it just seems to me that uh, I can't s seriously believe that, you know, military planners, regard Russia as, you know, some kind of existential threat to the United States or even its allies in NATO. I think if they marched into Poland, I think they'd have a really tough time, even if they were just fighting the Polish. You have a much right. more modernized army, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And of course, you know, never attacked a NATO country and presumably wouldn't. And it, yeah. Uh, uh, so I also just, yeah, I did want to point out from earlier that uh, when... Shapiro is going through his capsule summary of different administrations' relationships to Russia. He uh, he says that. Uh, so he talked about you know he sort of accurately said that you know that early on you know Bush and Putin were buddies or you know at least Bush thought they were. He looked into his soul, um, but um, but then like the only data point from the Obama years that he mentions is that that gesture with the reset button. Uh, but certainly one would think it would be relevant that, you know, Obama, uh, you know, very openly backed uh, the, um, whether you want to call it a coup or a revolution or whatever, you know, they uh, very openly backed the overthrow of the, uh, the pro-Russian pro -Russian government, uh, yeah. gover government in Ukraine and, you know, started the process of, you know, arming them. Uh, you know, for, for the subsequent war against pro-Russian separatists. And then, like, when he talks about Trump, I mean, you notice he spent, like, five seconds of that talking about Trump, right? He barely said anything. He all The only thing he said about Trump was, oh, and people expected that relations with Russia were going to be good under Trump. It's like, here's the thing. What nobody talks about, because it doesn't serve anyone's narrative, is that Trump was a way bigger anti-Russia hawk than Obama was. He, uh, yeah, he, Russia was arming arming the Ukrainians. Uh, he, you know, he. Allowed, I think. I think it was, and I may be wrong here, but I think he opened the spigot on certain anti aircraft weapons, which hadn't been transferred to the Ukrainians. I mean, there was a real uh, improvement in the military capacity of the Ukrainians between 2014 and the outbreak of this war, and you know that was partly because of a sustained policy from the United States to help reorganize the Ukrainian military into a more effective uh, fighting force. And that's a bipartisan uh, thing. You know, whatever, uh, and, and whatever Trump's personal relations with Putin were, they might have got on very well. But, you know, these, these are the, pre, you know, these are the leaders of states. Yeah. And, you know, w World War I happened when all the monarchs were like cousins from each other who had, you know, <laughs> yeah who had yeah. you know, months before the war had been hanging out and talking and, you know, uh, the Kaiser. Like, li like, literally, there's a famous picture of a bunch of them at one of their weddings that was like not very long before the war broke oh, out. 
Uh, yeah, totally. Uh, and yeah, and so yeah, sure. I, I think that's that's a perfect right. analogy there. And it's like, yeah, they have uh, that. Yeah, Trump transferred weapons to Ukraine that Obama had held back from because Obama thought it'd be too escalatory. Uh, you know, Trump uh, was... and Obama had escalated by being so you know outspoken in supporting the Euro Maidan. Whether you think it was a revolution or, or, or a coup, certainly the United States' vocal support for it helped, you know, legitimize the new administration that came into uh, uh, Ukraine at this time. I'm, you know, I'm not making yeah. any well, comments of that. No, but yeah. Without without making a moral judgment on that one way or the other, that is just true, right? That Obama, you know, Obama made decisions that escalated U.S. Russia, you know, tensions. There was a line which there were lines that Obama wasn't willing to cross that Trump was as far as sending heavier weaponry. Uh, certainly, in terms, you know, I mean, Obama famously held back from from bombing Syria, you know, after the the red line was crossed, um, and you know, Trump did. Bomb Syria, right? He uh, uh, he was willing to do that. Um, that's that, well. Obama you know. also did bomb Syria. He just didn't bomb Assad. Oh yeah. Okay. Fair enough. They, you know, both bomb targets in Syria, but you know, but Obama was famously unwilling to bomb Syrian like regime targets, and Trump was. Uh, that was that famous. What's that thing where like the news anchors gushing about how Trump became president? Oh yeah. You know, it, with, it is, yes, I remember. It was something about the. Uh, didn't they use a Leonard Cohen song to? to say yes, <laughs> yes, guided by the beauty of the weapons. Yeah, I remember that. And um, and and Trump was very aggressive and opposing, you know, Nord Stream two, uh, and you know, and in general, right? I mean, like like Trump was a pretty big anti Russia hawk, and then you know, and then when you know when he gets to Biden, it's just like you know, in this sort of neocon Ben Shapiro universe, it's just an article of faith that, of course you know, Biden's a huge pussy and, you know, he, he must, uh, you know, that like, uh, you know, so, so he must just be ruling over and letting, you know, letting Putin do anything, but it's like, well, hold on. Right. Like, uh, this is, this is certainly the, the most, uh, unpleasantly exciting U S Russia relations have been since at least the Cuban missile crisis. Is, yeah, and, uh, and for liberals in the United States, if anything, you know, the, the 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 Putin threat is key to the self identity of you know modern politics in the United States. You know the whole narrative of uh, Democratic party party supporting liberals is that there's this threat of fascism, the internal threat and the external threat, and the mastermind behind this threat is Vladimir Putin, right? So if anything, the hawkishness on Russia. Uh, is really being propelled by by liberals more so than neoconservatives who have yeah, framed is, it in this struggle against anti-fascism. Yeah, so which in fact... Fascism. Everybody's oh, yeah, right? fighting fascism. Putin's fighting fascism. The United States is fighting fascism. Everybody is fighting uh, the fascism. But for liberals, you know, um, Putin is the kind of hinge point of this global threat to democracy that we're hearing about, and which I truly, I only believe, the only person I believe truly believes that there's a threat to democracy in the United States is Chris Hayes. Everyone else, I just don't believe they deeply, truly feel it. Yeah, I mean... But it is their story. It is definitely their story, and it's it's really, I don't know, I always think of how much I liked um, that article that you and Michael Brooks wrote uh, years and years ago about, you know, comparing... Uh, you know, Trump's Republicans to the AKP, because um, what I really like about it is that it's an attempt to nudge American leftists into learning a second analogy. Yes. That, you know, like there are, lot, there are lots of bad and authoritarian things around the world. They don't all have to be the fucking Nazis. Yeah. I mean, it's like the discourse around colonialism and imperialism and all these, all these things are bad, but there are other bad things, you know? Yeah. And, lots and of we should. Things. We shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to reframe every bad thing as the 1930s and 40s Europe bad thing in order to get excited about being opposed to it, right? We can just, you know, we can just be opposed to lots of things for lots of reasons and, you know, say, yeah, look, there's definitely a disturbing authoritarian streak on the, on the American right, but I mean, it doesn't have to be, not everything has to be Hitler and Mussolini to be bad. Mm-hmm. 
as George W. Bush once put it. Now, that, that take has been proved false time and time again. Vladimir Putin is a highly intelligent, highly skilled adversary of the United States. His interests do not align with the interests of the West. The chief Russian motivation, and this has been true for literally centuries, is territorial ambition. This has been true since the time of Peter the Great and Catherine the Great. I mean, if you want to go back even further, this has been true since Ivan the Terrible. I mean, the, the fact is that if you look at Russian history or have any sense of Russian history, Russia's great leaders are always measured by the amount of land they control, which makes a certain amount of geopolitical sense if you are Russia, because, again, Russia is a giant step, meaning it is open to invasion from all sides. And so if you're Russian, one of the things that historically you have attempted to do is expand your borders so as to prevent invasion from all sides. Now, at a certain point, that defensive justification becomes an offensive strategy in which you're invading sovereign nations that exist all around you and attempting to control top down. But Russia has always been an empire since the time of Muscovy. And now you are watching as Vladimir Putin tries to expand the boundaries of what he sees as his new empire. I mean, he himself compared himself to Peter the Great just a couple of years ago after the invasion of Ukraine. And when you watch the interview that he did with Tucker Carlson, where the first 35 minutes is dedicated to his idea of Russian claims to Ukraine, in which he actually sort of makes the claim that Russia has claims to Poland and Hungary as well. When, when he says that sort of stuff, we ought to take that seriously. He's actually spelling out what he actively thinks. Now, there are a bunch of people on the left who think that Vladimir Putin is doing this because he is offended by the muscularity of the West, that if only the West had been more conciliatory toward Vladimir Putin, then Russia would not, in fact, be an adversarial force. That everything that Vladimir Putin does is blowback to the West. That is the theory of, of people on the left who are very much vacillating with regard to what Vladimir Putin is trying to do. And then there are a couple of theories on the right. And those theories range from the blowback theory, people ripping that off from John Mearsheimer, the foreign policy scholar, who I think is wrong about a great many things. John Mearsheimer has sort of theorized that it's NATO's expansion that drove Putin to invade South Ossetia, for example, in Georgia, or drove Putin to invade Crimea and the Donbass region originally in 2014 and then invade the rest of Ukraine in 2022. Right? There's that theory, which, again, is coincident with the left wing blowback theory of American foreign policy that dates all the way back to people like Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky. We'll get to more on this in just one second. First, free. You know that word? It should mean what it means. Free. And Pure Talk gets it. Oh, I always love the commercials on here. I love like Pure Talk. That sounds exciting. <laughs> I mean, I, I, also, it's just a little bit funny to me that uh, when he's trying to think of like lefty radicals that things can go all the way back to, it's all the way back to a guy who died a few years ago and a guy who's still alive. Yeah, and but who's very old. I mean, I think, I mean, I don't really know what to say about about what he's saying. Yes, there are people who, on the left, for example, who like to put all blame on on uh, for this conflict on, you know, uh, NATO expansion. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, it, there's a complex set of factors in play here. Yes, perhaps you know, Russian uh, imperial ambitions come into into play, but certainly. The comparison with pre-modern rulers of the Tsarist Empire and Vladimir Putin are somewhat out of place. You know, Russia sees itself as a great power and it sees itself as having the right to intervene and it's near abroad. The Russians probably are not so bothered about whether these countries are formally independent or not, but want them to be in their sphere of influence. And then, of course, a lot of these former Soviet countries you know, they have elements of their ruling class who want to move away from uh, uh, from Russia, uh, from Russian influence, not simply because of, quote unquote, anti-communism, but because, you know, there's a long history of repression of national minorities in, in Russia prior to the formation of the Soviet Union. Russia was in many ways the kind of guardian of the conservative order in Eastern Europe throughout the 19th century you know, sent troops in to crush the revolutions of 1848, et cetera, et cetera, all those kind of things. But, you know, it's a great power doing great power things, and it's coming into conflict with other great powers, and there are small nations caught in the middle who are trying to navigate between it, between them. And if you're a country on the edge of the Soviet Union, probably many people in that country are going to see the threat of Russian 
uh, imperialism greater than the threat of uh, American imperialism. Just as if you're in Haiti or Mexico, you're going to be a lot more concerned about what the United States is going to do than whether Russia is going to cut, suddenly come uh, and in, in, invade you. Your your perspective right. on who the big who the pre you know who the you know first order danger. Uh, to your country is, is going to be shaped by where your country is located and whether or not someone is going to intervene in, uh, you know, whether or not, you know, which country has an interest in intervening in your country. So the fact that uh, former Soviet republics, not all but some, are wary of Russia and sought to align themselves with, uh, with the West you may or may not agree with it. I'm not making a moral judgment, but it seems to be the kind of inevitable logic of, yeah, of a course. you know system of international relations based on the nation state. Yeah, I mean, you're pe sure. I mean, nations that don't have a lot of deterrent power of their own are going to seek out great power allies <laughs> to protect them against you know uh, whoever you know. I mean, it it, it makes all the sense in the world that, you know, that, that, uh, that you have like various Latin American, um, you know, governments that have, you know, sought out alliances at one point with the Soviet union and, you know, and, and, and even now might, you know, have some strong relationship with Russia or China because, you know, cause, cause it's in their interest to do so. And it's, it makes all the sense in the world that, you know, some neighbor, you know, some of Russia's neighbors, you know, seek out relationships with the West, of course, uh, and, and look, it's not, as you say, you know, Shapiro, is it wrong that, you know, I don't, whether or not you want to attribute it to this for specific figures he does, I mean, that might be a little unfair, but like, he's not wrong that there are people on the left uh, who get a little simplistic about this and talk about it as if, you know, as if U.S. imperialism is the only source of, of conflict uh, in the world, which is of course not true and it's important to have a more nuanced view of this, but also, um, you know, I mean, the U S is by far <laughs> the most powerful empire in the world, uh, to today, right. No, nothing else comes close and it does actually exercise quite a bit of influence over what happens. That doesn't mean it's all powerful. It's certainly not right. But like, it's, uh, you know, I mean, if, if you, uh, it's, if you're sort of an American who, uh, is, you know, would not like, doesn't want various kinds of wars and conflicts to happen, it is actually not an irrational thing to say, huh, I wonder if my country is doing stuff that we shouldn't be doing that makes this more likely to happen. And that would be a rational question to ask, even if the U.S. were only exerting a little bit of influence over the world, uh, since since it's still, you know, the country that we live in and, you know, has, uh, and, and you know, and, and it's any influence that we could possibly hope to have, uh, although certainly not much, uh, is, uh, is, is here, but you know, it's even more rational when the U S is this world, you know, striding behemoth with hundreds of military bases spread around the planet, uh, ex you know, many, 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 you know, uh, interventions around the world, et cetera. And yeah, that doesn't mean that like, um, you know, Maidan, was something that only happened because of us support. I think there is some, you know, for example, I think there is this bad inference that people make where they're like, Oh, look, there was some national endowment for democracy money going to some actors that, you know, played a role there. Therefore like the CIA just like, you know, willed this into existence. Uh, I, I don't think that's true, but you know, but at the same time, it's like, yeah, look, the, it's not like the United States is just sort of like, hanging out, minding its own business. And then all these bad people who've got Ben Shapiro. So exercised, you know, just, just act out and the U S is only responding to it. It doesn't exercise any agency. Yeah. I mean, you know, obviously you have a, a host of dynamics that, you know, led to this conflict in the Ukraine. And, you know, if we want to critique uh, U S foreign policy from this perspective, perhaps the United States should not be, getting involved in, in these countries because it serves to escalate them, uh, uh, escalate these uh, conflicts. And, but, and by, the, by the way, it's also bad for the people that we're intervening on behalf of, not just because of the escalation, but also because, you know, just structurally, you know, it's not like Ukrainians, for example, are in a position to, 
you know, it's not like, you know, the president has to worry about carrying Ukraine in the next election, right? You know, they're, they're, they're not, you know, in a position to, uh, to sort of exert power over the United States, which is a built-in problem with interventionism, because even the people you're intervening on behalf of, oftentimes it's very cruel that, like, you know, because you, you're intervening when it's in your interest to do so, and, like, while, you know, there's, there's like, plenty of money sloshing around to do so, and then a few years later, you know, you might very well be in a position where it's like, well, we're not going to do this forever, and then those people are left high and dry, which is, you know... The, you know with the Ukrainians right now, it seems like everybody's forgotten about the Ukraine war. Nothing's passing, so, yeah, and, and, and that's and that's like a big, you, you know, that's like a horrible thing to to do to people. I mean, if if they um, that you know, I mean, if they, I mean, like, if you know, Ukrainians had made a negotiated settlement uh, years ago when it seemed like it it was you know it was possible early in the war, then you know they'd be in a much better position now uh, territorially and you know whatever than like to have the U.S be given the impression there was going to be U S support forever. And then, uh, and then have that eventually dry up. And now they're kind of fucked. Yeah. Killer leftism. That Russia. And then there is a theory that Russia is actually a bulwark against secular leftism. That Russia actively is, is a highly religious country that is, that is very anti much of the left-wing ideology with regard to, say, gender and sex and sexuality that the West has fallen for. And so they built up in their minds, a lot of people, the idea that because Russians are socially conservative as a general matter, which they are, that this is somehow what Vladimir Putin represents, as opposed to he has a population that is socially conservative and also that is not his actual ambition. His actual ambition is not in defense of, say, social conservatism. His ambition is in defense of Russian territorial ambition. It, it, it's a category error, in other words, for many people on the right. Many people on the right have made that same category error, for example, with Sharia law countries in the Islamic world. It suggested that because those countries are, quote unquote, socially conservative, that somehow those countries have a commonality with, say, American conservatism, American Christian conservatism. And the answer there is no, they really don't. Their ambitions are not the same as your ambitions. And what this really reveals is a schism in the United States broadly writ and in the West broadly writ in Europe as well, a schism about whether the West has any sense of internal solidity. What are the values of the West? Because if Putin is able to split the West on the basis of perceived values or perceived anti-Westernism, and that says there are a lot of people in the West who really don't like the West very much, on the one hand, and a lot of people in the West who believe that the greater threat to the United States might be their neighbors who disagree with them about social politics, as opposed to people like Vladimir Putin. Not that Vladimir Putin is a direct threat to people in the United States, like right this instant, but he's a very large indirect threat to people in the United States because geopolitics actually matters. When you cut off shipping routes, when you destroy the sources of international trade, when you threaten American allies, these are things that actually will matter to American citizens writ large. Okay, so Vladimir Putin is figuring that the history of the United States since World War II is if you can split the American public, you can win. And it doesn't matter how weak you are. All you have to do is outlast. Outlasting is the strategy. This has been true since Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. It was true of the Taliban in Afghanistan. It was true of Sharia law, Iranian forces in Iraq. If you can outlast the United States, you will win. And the time for outlasting is shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. So it used to be that in order to outlast the American public, you would have to wait a decade. And now because of the velocity of social media and because of the ability of people to see these arguments in real time and split from each other and polarize very quickly, what you're seeing is that the West is sapped of its will incredibly quickly on nearly every conflict. When there is a conflict with true evil, you see Western powers immediately leap to fight the evil and then pretty quickly start to doubt themselves and figure, okay, I think we're done here. We need to move on with our lives. Now, this would be a time when political leadership actually mattered, but there's a complete dearth of political leadership on both sides of the political aisle on these matters. Joe Biden is utterly incapable of articulating the rationale why Americans should care if Russia invades Ukraine. He does not, he does not even attempt to articulate. It. He just spouts words like democracy without taking full stock of the actual situation for Americans. Because Americans look at Joe Biden say things like democracy and they say, wait, hold up a second. Ukraine, first of all, is an, extra an extraordinarily imperfect democracy. 
right? The Freedom House score for Ukraine is like 39. Russia is like seven, but Ukraine is like 39. So it's not like an amazing wellspring of democracy. It is a burgeoning democracy at best. And so when you say democracy over and over, Americans are like, well, is that really what Ukraine is about? And then Americans say, well, if, if that's what Ukraine is really about, then why are we allies with, say, Saudi Arabia? Because Saudi Arabia obviously is not a democracy. By the way, a lot of our allies who are not democracies start to get very nervous when they hear democracy talk coming from Joe Biden because they're like, OK, so what are you going to Arab spring us over here? The real reason why the United States is pursuing a defense of Ukraine is because we have geostrategic interests in degrading the Russian military capacity to expand beyond its own borders, threaten shipping lanes threatening supply resources, increasing the power of enemies of America and America's allies. Russia has formed a de facto coalition with China and Iran at this point. And that de facto coalition threatens America's allies all around the world and threatens freedom of the seas, for example, everywhere from the Taiwan Straits to the Straits of Malacca to the Red Sea, to the Straits of Hormuz. Right? That, that coalition, it's extremely dangerous. And the United States does have a geopolitical interest in downgrading that. But that's not something that Joe Biden can explain because he can't say words anymore and probably doesn't understand the words that he is saying right now. And on the right, there's a split about whether these things even matter. There's this bizarre idea that has arisen on large parts of the right that America can become autarkic, that suddenly global economics don't matter at all, that if these that if, if things go to hell in a handbasket with regard to the freedom of the seas in these particular areas, it won't affect American citizens in any way. Let me just explain. If shipping starts to be truly endangered the way that it is in the Red Sea, in any of the other areas that I just mentioned, the amount of money that Americans are going to pay is going to be so much larger than whatever checks we are signing to Ukraine, it will make your head spin. If you loved the inflation of the first couple of years of the Biden era, wait until freedom of the seas goes away. It's something that you're going to enjoy. Okay, so in any case, Vladimir Putin knows all of this because all he has to do is just keep pressing. All he has to do is keep pressing. And so he's taking full advantage. He sees the splits and he's exploiting those splits. Right? He's a smart player. Vladimir Putin is a smart geopolitical player who sees foreign policy as a zero-sum game. And no attempt to appease Vladimir Putin through happy talk is going to work. Again, I went through the various administrations in the United States since Vladimir Putin took office in 2000. Every single one of those administrations has tried a detente policy with Vladimir Putin, and all of them have failed. Because guess what? Every one of those administrations ends. Every one of them has a shift in Congress. And Vladimir Putin's still there, ruling in unitary fashion. The downside of dictatorship is it generally means a poorly run country that has no feedback loops for improvement of the country. You can list certain countries, by the way, that have had quasi dictatorships that have actually run fairly well. That was true, for example, of, of Singapore for several decades. But it's very rare. More likely, it turns into a corrupt oligarchy in which the leader uses his position in order to enrich himself and his friends in order to ensure his own power and destroys his adversaries. And one of the best ways to maintain your own power is to destroy things like internal property rights and political freedoms. Because if you give property rights, that may lead to the creation of a monetary base from which a threat can, can mount against you. So Vladimir Putin has been very, very bad for the Russian people. If you don't believe me, all you have to do is, is look at the various GDPs per capita in the former Soviet satellite states. GDP per capita right now in states like Poland, right? Poland is a former Soviet satellite state. GDP per capita there is about $18,000. GDP per capita in Estonia, a former Soviet satellite state, is $28,000. GDP per capita in Latvia, a former Soviet satellite state, $21,000. GDP per capita in Russia right now is $12,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. Vladimir Putin has not been a boon to Russia. Okay, putting all that aside again. None of that made any sense. So number one, it's quite funny that he is actually completely unable to articulate an ideological reason that we want to support Ukraine. Uh, so he leans on the material reasons, appeals to Americans' self-interest for if you want your cheap crap, then you know Russia's a threat to the uh, uh, threat to the seas. And then he cites the, the 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 Red Sea now and what's going on in the Red Sea as being uh, being an issue. But he's also tying this to the fact that China and Russia and Iran have created this block that is, you know, threatening American hegemony and uh, threatening navigation off the seas. Well, number one, China cares very much about navigation of the seas. And I'm pretty sure the Chinese don't actually want to pay for that navigation of the seas protection. They're quite happy for the United States to pick up that cost and pick up that burden. Uh, 
Number two, what evidence is there that Russia is a particular threat to navigation of the seas? They rely on exporting their grain to large parts of the developing world. And in fact, you know, the, the fact that uh, sea lanes were closed and there were sanctions caused extreme I I inflation in, in parts of the developing world uh, as food supplies uh, were cut up. So he's trying to make this material case that, well, you know, Russia's going to threaten navigation of the seas. I don't see it, right? Mm -hmm. The threat to the navigation of the seas will come from perhaps non-state actors or smaller actors who don't have a deep stake in international trade, but Russia and certainly China have a huge stake in the global uh, economic system, in the global economic order, and also to a certain degree, the maintenance of the American pointless empire to us, you know, in, in the sense that they see, you know, they might not like American influence in general, but they probably aren't too unhappy with having some U.S. military presidents uh, uh, providing security for their ships, you know, for their, for their trade. Because where is all that trade going to? Where is it coming from? So it's a very misleading argument. He's trying to make it sound clever, saying, but it's interesting that he just can't, he can't go to a kind of ideological point here. Uh, because, of course, like he says, Saudi Arabia is a dictatorship. Ukraine is a, a very imperfect democracy. Uh, you know, whether a group uh, or a country is democratic or not really has no bearings on 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 uh, on whether the United States will support it. So he he's he's trying to what is it they call a gish gallop? He's just throwing a lot yeah. of he's throwing a lot of things out there that sounds like he's making a coherent argument, but he's not demonstrating any of his points. Where's the examples of the Russians blowing up ships? or blowing up international connections. If, if anything, uh, you know, the closest thing we have to that for, uh, is the Nord Stream pipe. And I don't think the Russians blew up the Nord Stream pipe. And yeah. then when we look at the attacks on shipping in the, in the Red Sea, historically, they come from places like uh, 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 Somalia, where you have a, a failed state uh, in existence. And then more recently with the Houthis, and that's more, that's directly, related to the conflict that's going on in Israel-Palestine, not really directly related uh, uh, to Russia. So, you know, if we, look, if we want to bring in some World War II analogies, you know, R America's, you know, Hitler initially didn't want to abolish the British Empire, right? He saw it as a mm -hmm. defeat the British, but he saw the British Empire as a force for stability. Yeah, I mean, he he didn't, originally he thought he wasn't even going to have to defeat the British Empire. He thought he could like make a deal. You know, he thought he could cut a deal with it, and that you know um, that if he could basically get them to disinterest themselves in what happened in continental Europe, then you know, then he he always said like, oh, why would I want the British Empire to go away? One, he was a big admirer of the British Empire, and and and, and so, two, and two, he always said it's like, look, if it if the British empire collapses, you know, Germany won't really benefit. It'll be, you know, America and, you know, like the, you know, uh, other countries will, will, will benefit from it. So, so if yeah. Any part of the American imperial footprint that Russia and China would like to keep intact while dismantling other aspects of it, it will be the U S Navy providing protection for international shipping lanes. Sure. The Chinese might want to, might want the U.S. to pull out of Korea and Taiwan, no doubt. Maybe get the get out of uh, um, uh, the Philippines and give China a sphere of influence. But the Chinese don't want to have to deploy their navy to 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 you know the Straits of Hormuz or places like that. They'll, they're quite content to let the uh, Americans uh, deal with that. I'm pr I think pretty much the same uh, for for the Russians. So his his entire argument falls flat because he can't show an example of how Russia is threatening international shipping lanes. If anything, Russia wants to open up international shipping lanes so it can get things out of uh, its warm water ports in the Black Sea and, and places like that. Yeah. Uh, the other two things that struck me about this are, one, um, this whole thing that he's going off on about how GDP per capita is 18,000 in Poland and only 12,000 in Russia – I have no idea what point he thinks he's making there. Uh, like it, it seems like um, something uh, maybe like the lack of democracy is 
bad for the economy, although that seems very hard to fit with some of what he acknowledged elsewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, he, you know, he's just, you know, like there's almost, it almost seems like there's some weird insinuation with that thing about property rights that he thinks that like Putin is doing like economic leftism rather than overseeing a gangster capitalist oligarchy. Uh, but, um, but, but yeah, th- th- this all does seem very gish gallopy. And going. I would also, I would also know, I'm sure Ben Shapiro is very much in favor of sanctions on Iran and those sanctions on Iran <clears throat> absolutely ensure that no independent uh, financial basis for op- uh, opposition to the Iranian government can come into existence because it basically uh, helps consolidate the Iranian regime, uh, the Iranian economy in the hands of the regime and its allies. So he's pretty disingenuous about that because I'm sure if we go back, we'll find Ben Shapiro big advocate of of sanctions. Yeah, of course, and and I also um, and then the you know the other point uh, is the one that uh, that I wanted to to touch was the one that I saw. Uh, the uh well anyway i can't find any more i think it was the boss in uh in the chat said this that um it is really funny watching how far shapiro has to strain to differentiate his view on all this from joe biden's yeah i think i think yeah the boss made the point that shapiro basically supports the biden policy but his audience doesn't want to hear that biden is doing what he wants them to do So he has to like fabricate nonsense or moan about Joe Biden not using the right terminology. It's pretty, it's a pretty weak argument. He's, he's just, you know, viscerally yelling about why aren't we being more muscular on the world scene, world scene. Well, Ben Shapiro, if you're so convinced about this, why don't you get your ass out there and do a USO show or something like that (laughs) or go fight. Hey, yeah, uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the IDF are recruiting. If you, if you want to, if you want some action, the IDF are surely recruiting. There are definitely American uh, mercenaries in Ukraine uh, and and vol- I mean, just American volunteers in Ukraine. You know, if you wanted to fight in that war, uh, I, I think the I think the opportunities for uh, Ben to display his martial prowess uh, and uh, on the side that he prefers are are just they're waiting for him. Uh, but it, it's also just incredible because yeah, I mean, what, what is it exactly that he wants the Biden administration to do that they aren't doing right. I mean, they're, they're... Send tanks into the Ukraine, deploy American soldiers there, deploy NATO soldiers there. I really don't, you know, like any, yeah, further... yeah, yeah. what is it that goes beyond what the Biden administration has done that wouldn't, um, that wouldn't put us in the last two minutes of Dr. Strange love that Ben wants to do. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even if you're the most, uh, you know, vociferously pro Ukrainian person, um, you have to understand that obviously there are going to be red lines for the Russians, uh, which could have a really big dangerous effect on international stability. I mean, forget about freedom of navigation. If everyone nukes each other, it only takes one. So, you know, it's not that I'm super worrying about nuclear warfare, but like a- a- escalation is unpredictable. You might get away with it, but then you might get away with it until you don't. You know, dangerous policies seem genius until they don't work. I mean, to to bring it back to Israel, you know, Bibi could make a really good case to his domestic constituency for a long time that he's dealt with the Palestinian issue and you don't need to worry about it. We've walled them off and we can forget about them. And that worked until it didn't work. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, I mean, yeah, I'm not I don't stay up at night worrying about uh you know nuclear war now right uh maybe it did a little bit when this first started in 2022 uh because it seemed really dangerous that we were crossing all kinds of lines that had not been crossed before in the history of u.s russia relations um and you know and yeah as you said it's a dangerous game right i mean it's like yeah probably you can get away with it but uh there is that uncomfortable hitch in your voice as you say it, right? Because uh, yeah, we'll see. 
And, uh, and certainly, you know, I mean, look, there is a reason why we haven't had, uh, we haven't had direct shooting wars between, uh, nuclear armed countries since we've had nuclear arms, right. You know, that they, that it seems like everybody is rightly terrified, uh, that, uh, those wars wouldn't stay conventional. And, you know, it's like, yeah, cause short of that, what has Biden not done? He's imposed crazy sanctions. He's had, um, you know, he's he's poured, you know, more and more money and arms into Ukraine, including many times where it's like, okay, we're not going to we're not going to do this because that's too escalatory. And then a month later, oh fuck it, we'll do it. Uh, there's, um, you know, there have been. Um, you I mean, know, put it another way: if you're, and I have, you know, I have conservative sure. friends. I talk to old neocons and things like that uh, who are like diehard Republicans. But even they, who, you know, in their honest moments will say, Biden's actually doing the best policy you can do. He's pushing the Russians right up to the line, uh, but not going too far. The escalation is slow. You know, you know, from a neoconservative per- perspective, Biden, and to a certain degree, you know, the Biden administration is doing exactly what you know you would want them to do because you don't want american troops to be involved in that but on the sa- at the same time you want to quote unquote degrade russian capacities limit them you know uh, give them military humili- humiliation he's doing pretty much and you know i heard this from a a a conservative a, a personal friend of the ashcroft family said like <laughs> you know, honestly he was like honestly you know, I can't really complain about the Biden administration and their policy on Ukraine. And he's a guy who's been to Ukraine to do medical aid and stuff like that. He's like a, a, a you know, weekend warrior type of guy. And even he's admitting that, you know, this is the, this is this is the policy that if a Republican was doing it, we'd be praising it. Yeah, right. Exactly. Because, yeah. But we, like, what is the like you really can't put a piece of paper in between um the position of old school neocons like Ben Shapiro and the Biden, you know, position on Russia, Ukraine, like, uh, cause, and you know, that's why, I mean, even Ben Shapiro isn't being like, Oh, Biden is weak. Cause he didn't like set up a no fly zone and start directly shooting down Russian planes. Cause I think even he realizes that would be insane. So, um, he's left complaining that Biden isn't using the right rhetoric to justify it. But then even there, as you say, he's kind of floundering around because, like, what exactly is his objection to the Biden rhetoric? Um, it's, you know, like, because he has to admit, well, Biden has been using sort of pretty much classic neocon rhetoric about this, right? You know, where it's all about democracy, et cetera. So to find an angle to attack him, Shapiro has to be honest about how little democracy has to do with it. You know, with the point about the Saudis, the point about how Ukraine is sure more democratic than Russia, but you know, according to those freedom house rankings, he mentioned less democratic than, you know, many other post-Soviet States, even, you know, it's about the middle of the pack for post-Soviet States, less democratic than, for example, Victor Orban's Hungary, not generally regarded as a wonderful example of democracy, uh, et cetera. Uh, so it's like, okay, well, democracy doesn't have anything to do with it. So like now you're mad that Biden is talking about freedom and democracy instead of saying that like our economic navigation of the seas, like you yeah. want to and say we have to defeat Russia and Ukraine for navigation of the seas. Come yeah. On. Which is like, okay, one, as you say, is just not even true. Right. I mean, like he can't come up with, you know, he has no concrete examples of the, you know, how the issues are even intersected here. And two, even if it were true, look, if it was a purely pragmatic argument, it's not like this is, you know, you know, instead of doing what Biden is doing, what most of the Ukraine hawks do and talking about freedom and democracy, you just said, oh, pragmatically, it's like in our economic interests to uh, to oppose Russia. It's like, well, is that really going to be what's going to whip people up? about supporting this that i don't think so i think that like the sort of rational response if you're like oh we're worried about the long-term effects on you know the the sea lanes or whatever or you know it's going to be economically bad for us in some way it's like okay well 
if, if that's the concern, why not just make a deal with Putin to, uh, to you know, keep the keep the sea lanes open and, you know, and and, and make sure that, you know, you're going to be taken I mean, care of. I mean, if it, was, if it was just about the money and, and the Ooh. global economy, if if the United States had just left you, Ukraine to Putin's tender mercies, you know, the global economy would have been far less disrupted. Yeah, exactly. Like the thing that's disrupting the global economy uh, is, you know, having the war drag on for this long is all the sanctions and isolation of Russia. Like that's the stuff that causes all the big economic disruption, right? Not, not, you know, whether, you know, Russia holds sway over more or less of, of Ukraine. Right. So it just, it just doesn't even make sense on its own terms, but I guess he says it very quickly and confidently. Vladimir Putin is winning right now because all he feels he has to do is outlast. Not only that, the weaponry that we are shipping to Ukraine in defense is much more expensive than the weaponry that Vladimir Putin is using in offense in Ukraine. We'll get to more on this in just one moment. First, are you struggling with back taxes or unfiled returns this year? Well, I've got some bad news. The IRS, the reason that Vladimir Putin is able to ramp up his production, which can last probably effectively another two to three years, at the levels that he is currently producing, they're spending like 6% of their GDP on defense, by which we mean offense in places like Ukraine. That's unsustainable for an economy that's truly unworkable in Russia. They do not have a workable economy. It is 50% probably based on oil profits. They, they do have trading partners, of course, outside the West. But have they been economically damaged by the war in Ukraine? Absolutely. It's damaged everybody, but it has certainly hit Russia. You can see it in terms of the inflation rate. But the reality is that Russia can produce kind of crappy old machinery and ammo. And it costs a lot less money than defensive machinery. You, by the way, you see this all over the globe. Right? It costs Hamas like 50 bucks to, to create a Katyusha rocket that they can shoot into an Israeli city. And it costs Israel like $50,000 every time they fire an Iron Dome. That sort of stuff happens all the time across the globe. It's one of the reasons why the Houthis are being effective in the Red Sea right now. Offensive measures that are basic and dumb cost almost nothing. Defensive measures, which have to be sophisticated to stop the offensive measures, are very, very expensive, which is why, from a financial point of view, a be a offense is better than defense. From a financial point of view, during war in the moment right now, destroying the enemy's capacity to make war is actually easier than defending against the war that they are attempting to fight against you. Again, all of this is just predicate to the fact that Vladimir Putin really is feeling his oats right now. So not only... Did he almost certainly kill Alexei Navalny? I say almost certainly because, you know, you try to be a little careful about these things, but he he killed Alexei. Alexei Navalny did not die of natural causes in a prison at the age of 47 after being poisoned by Vladimir Putin just about four years ago and then immediately arrested upon his return to Russia, sentenced to a gulag for 30 plus years, and then he randomly dies. That is not the way that works. Gulag, not a gulag. Especially not for Vladimir Putin, who makes a habit of killing him. <laughs> What's that? Not a gulag, anything but a gulag. You know, sentence him to a gulag. I mean, it, he's, Ben Shapiro has been pretty ridiculous. I did want to hear about the tax services, but... Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. But I would trust Ben Shapiro on what is a good tax service. I actually have a theory that Ben Shapiro on a personal level is probably actually a really nice person. It's just the character he plays on TV, and he might give you good tax advice. Yeah, if... Uh... <laughs> Yeah, I, I actually have something on that, but I, uh, that, that's got to be an off-air conversation. That's, a, that's an off-air conversation. But, you know, he's, it's quite uh, interesting. I, I am very skeptical of his uh, theory that offensive warfare is cheaper than defensive uh, warfare. It kind of depends on the technological base of your military, whether you're doing offensive or defensive uh, warfare. I mean, ISIS was doing offensive warfare, and they were, you know, not – they were often armed with – uh, sometimes with stolen U.S. Uh, uh, weaponry, but, you know, a lot of old yeah. weaponry as well. So, A, I'm very skeptical about that claim that he's making there about the cost of uh, cost of defensive versus offensive war. And secondly, well, you know, if we're selling all these weapons that we're making here in the United States, well, isn't that an economic argument for, for you know, that's, that would be probably the economic argument he could have deployed uh, to appeal to American self-interest. He's like, look, it's all about the economy, e economics. The government should buy, buy a bunch of weapons, right, from American companies and then give them to the Ukrainians and then do the same. 
Uh, and that's going to benefit some Americans who are working, working in the war industries. But that's kind of a less sexy argument, right? When you say, look, we need to support this war because selling weapons to Ukraine really uh, juices up our military industrial complex. And that's a real employer in the United States. I would yeah. respect him more if he made that argument, to be honest. Yeah, although um, you can kind of see why he does not, because I'm, I'm just trying to imagine, you know, um, like Joe Biden getting up, you know, later this week to do the State of the Union and being like, I know there's some people in this chamber who want to end U aid to Ukraine. But, but my 401k is in Raytheon stock. And <laughs> exactly, right? Like if he said that, right, that's... Well, you know, I would enjoy it, but uh, I think that's about what you could say uh, in favor of him making the argument from Raytheon Jobs uh, for uh, for current uh, for current U.S. foreign policy. His political opponents, and in fact, unsurprisingly, the Kremlin has now rejected international calls, according to Axios, for an independent investigation into Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny's death in prison. Navalny's allies and family, of course, say that they suspect high-level Russian authorities were involved in his death, which, of course, is absolutely true. I'm sure. The European Council said Mr. Navalny's unexpected and shocking death is yet another sign of the accelerating and systematic repression in Russia. Kremlin has re they've refused to release his body because they're afraid that if they release his body, then they're going to discover the poison on him or the bruises on him or the broken bones or whatever it is. The country's prison services said he died suddenly after a walk. They claimed he fell unconscious after feeling sick and could not be resuscitated. Of course, all of this has sort of outsized impact in the West because there was a very famous HBO documentary made about Alexei Navalny that won Best Picture, for, uh, best, best Documentary at the Oscars just a couple of years ago. It is a very, very compelling documentary all about his poisoning and his attempt to track down the people who poisoned him, which he actually does. He actually calls one of his poisoners on the phone and gets them to admit the whole thing on the phone. The very tail end of that documentary, Alexei Navalny actually is asked, what is your message to the Russian people in case you're murdered? And here's what he had to say. He says, listen, I've got something very obvious to tell you. You're not allowed to give up. If they decide to kill me, it means that we are incredibly strong. We need to utilize this power to not give up. To remember we're a huge power. That is being impressed by these bad dudes. We don't realize how strong we actually are. The only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good people to do nothing. So don't be inactive. Okay, and then he was murdered. So either his murder is a reflection of Putin feeling threatened or... His murder is a reflection of the fact that Putin thinks he can get away with nearly anything at this point. And it seems more like the latter, especially because they're not being shy about anything that they are doing right now. Vladimir Putin, according to the Russian news agency, the Russian government has now filed charges against Oleg Navalny, who is the who is the brother of Alexei Navalny. They said wanted under an article of the criminal code. They did not specify what article Navalny's brother was even wanted under. So they're just arresting Alexei Navalny's relatives who are in Russia right now in an attempt to presumably quash any blowback from their decision to kill Alexei Navalny. Not just that, on Tuesday, Russia's main security agent agency said that they had arrested another American citizen. This person's a dual citizen of Russia and the United States on accusations of committing state treason by raising funds for Ukraine. The FSB identified the detainee as a 33-year-old woman who lives in Los Angeles. Apparently, she had raised $51 for a Ukrainian organization that bought weapons and other equipment for Ukraine's military. That's because she had sent 50 bucks to Razum for Ukraine, a New York-based nonprofit organization that sends assistance to the country. And uh, the FSB released via Russian state media a video that showed the woman wearing a white hat that covered her eyes, being handcuffed and escorted by masked security service officers. If convicted, she faces 20 years in prison. And of course, this makes perfect sense, considering that Russia is making just a bounty off of American citizens they kidnap. But why does if they ben arrest Brittany Griner for being foolish enough to fly to. Why does, ben care about, why does Ben care about any of this? This is like, again, another, you know, you're the logic man, Ben, but this doesn't seem to follow on from the argument he's making, because at no. the outset, he said that, you know, this is not about democracy, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we have allies with people like Saudi Arabia. Well, 
you know, let's talk about Saudi Arabia. Like, what's what's going on there with activists getting, you know, chopped up in, in into into pieces? Uh, and you know, that guy Khashoggi, he wasn't even that hardcore of a opponent. He was like a loyal opposition to the Saudis or the internal repression that takes place there. He's bringing this up, but he's already said that it doesn't really matter. Like. You know that the the problem with Russia isn't that they have a, they're a dictatorship or an authoritarian regime because he's already conceded we ally with pretty horrible regimes, including Saudi Arabia, which I would make the case is probably uh, on a similar level of freedom to uh, uh, to to Russia uh, as yeah, it I mean, were. It's, 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 Saudi Arabia. And you yeah. and you like say something against that silly gnome gnome project they're building, the big line city. Mm -hmm. You might end up fish food. So yeah, I mean it's certain it's a big tangent Saudi, from Saudi is Saudi is like, look, I don't want to. You know, this is not a this is not a defense of Russia, which is a extremely unfree and undemocratic place. But you know, in in certain obvious respects, Saudi Arabia is actually much worse. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I just I just think it's a very he's, he's being extremely disingenuous because he's giving us this emotional story of uh, of Navalny, whether you like Navalny or don't like Navalny, whether you support, you know, the guy was killed under dubious circumstances in prison. But Ben, why does this matter? Because you've already told us that it doesn't matter. Trying to convince us that Putin is a bad guy doesn't have anything to do with the argument you set out at the beginning. No, in he fact, it's, it's exactly the kind of argument you said you weren't going to set out because, you know, you briefly understood for a moment that it wouldn't really be relevant to uh, supporting U.S. policy that, you know, is, uh, you know, Putin, uh, Putin, you know, yes, uh, I would be pretty shocked if Putin didn't have <laughs> Duvaldi killed. Uh, but hey, he might not, he might not, Putin might not have given the order, you know, people, people. Not sure. Can, in a dictatorship, it pays to know what the leader wants without him asking for you. Fair enough. Um, but yes, but also, of course, um, you know, uh, yes, Jamal Khashoggi being cut up with the bone saw is a pretty obvious example. Uh, and, you know, in, you know, this is why in a certain respect, in a certain sense, I'm a huge defender of whataboutism, which is to say that, yeah, yeah, I understand in the strict sense it's bad. If you're saying X isn't bad because Y is, you know, Y is bad. Yes, that's, that's silly. You shouldn't say that. But the kind of thing that people are often thinking of when they accuse each other of whataboutism is just sort of asking people to consider parallel examples and, yeah. uh, and, and apply consistent standards. Right. And it's like, okay, well, yes, I think it's very bad. Uh, that Navalny was, you know, poisoned and imprisoned and, you know, probably eventually murdered. Uh, you know, I also think, you know, I mean, without even going to as extreme a case as Khashoggi, right? I think it's very, very bad that the uh, U.S. is extraditing Julian Assange for doing mm -hmm. journalism. Um, and, but if we're going to probe for consistency here, the question to ask is what would I want other powers to do in response to the Assange prosecution? Um, and, you know, and that's like, do, do I want, and for that matter, what does Ben Shapiro want the Biden administration to do in response to Navalny that they're not already doing? I mean, like, you know, you, you have fewer cards to play once you've played them all. Uh, and it's, it's particularly, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it is, it is particularly telling in this case that, you know, he, when he had to, to, to like fish around for a place to criticize Biden, even though he completely agrees with Biden's Ukraine policy, he was like, oh, he's doing the wrong justification. Uh, but then it's like, well, the justification should really be about self-interest, not democracy. But then it's like, look, you can't have like, how excited are people going to be? by that justification, not very, right? Like you can, there is a reason why uh, people keep going back to the well of World War II to justify everything. Cause, cause that's something that, you know, that, that like actually strikes large numbers of people to this day is like, yeah, that was a cause worth dying for. Whereas if you say, oh, we have to do this because Raytheon provides so many jobs, 
you know, it's, it's pretty hard for most normal people to get it up for that. And it's in this particular, you know, and so like even Ben Shapiro can't sustain it over the course of a single podcast episode. It's like, you know, he's not going to keep making the, you know, arguments about self-interest and shipping lanes. It's like, if, if he wants to get his audience excited about this, even he realizes on some level, he's not going to do it like that. He's got to do the freedom and democracy push and, you know, talk about Navalny. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument. To access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more, go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish. <laughs>